there, I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day. So glad to have you with me as I take you around San Diego. I'll catch you up on what you may have missed and look ahead at what's to come. Top story for a second week in a row, the Padres. They are making us all so proud. It really brings everyone together and it is simply our turn for this victory. Thompson. You remember it well. Padres fans are fired up for more games now against the Phillies. And you can bet once again they will be loud. And as CBS 8 Steve Price found out, their enthusiasm is a big hit with the players. Another sold out standing room only crowd will pack Petco Park for tonight's playoff game against the Phillies. The good news is we've now had three days to rest our voices after all that screaming on Saturday. But here's the real question. Does all that noise really affect the play on the field? Petco Park literally shaking Saturday night. The crowd pumped up, hoping their screams can help end more than 20 years of Friar frustration. And it worked. The Padres scoring five runs in the seventh inning to come from behind and beat the Dodgers. Awesome, man. We feed off it so much. We're never out of it with these fans. We're never out of the game with them. I feel great for the city of San Diego because they showed up these last two games and really inspired us to win. It was like an avalanche there at the end. They held the time. This place was insane in the last two days. So um, they, they gave us the feel and we just went with it. 2-2 two -two pitch. Pitcher Joe Musgrove admits the crowd was so loud, at first it fired him up a bit too much, but the El Cajon native quickly calmed himself down and understands just how big this is for all of San Diego. These fans deserve it, man. They've been waiting for so long, and I used to be that fan that was waiting. Even those players new to the area appreciate just how special this moment is. This town, you can feel the passion, you can see it every night, and um, just keep coming out and supporting. And if you doubted that fired up fans make a difference, check out this moment in the seventh inning when Jose Azokar encouraged the crowd to get even louder. The team is having fun, but they also know this season isn't just about beating the Dodgers. It's about bringing San Diego its first ever World Series championship. It's all about the want. We want it. We want it for the city. We want it for this organization. So keep the faith and keep getting louder. Amazing. I love it. I love it. I need you guys to keep coming and get, keep getting loud. At Peco Park, Steve Price, CBS 8. It gives me goosebumps. Let's do it again, right? For some, though, getting a ticket is out of the question. So as CBS 8's Jasmine Ramirez shows us, she'll tell us where to score some of the best views without ever entering Petco Park. Right now we're on the seventh floor of the Legend Condos and it has a great view of Petco Park. Now, if you're not lucky enough to be a resident here, there are several other high rise options for you to watch this week's games. Tonight, we search the city for rooftops above the ballparks. This is, I call it the hidden treasure. We visited Hotel Indigo's Level 9 rooftop bar. It's just been so exciting. You know, just, we thought the season was over. We weren't going to get any more of the baseball games, any more of the pregame excitement. But then Padres came through. And that excitement just keeps building. Even during the games, Level 9 is open to the public without any extra cost. The Padres seemed like more of a destination team that we would host a lot of fans from other cities. But it's nice to see more of a, a local crowd here. Next, we visited Altitude Sky Lounge. It's a rooftop bar 22 floors above Petco. This is like a great view. I had heard about it and I wanted to see this. Angelo is from L.A. and admits he's gotten past the Dodgers' loss. I got over it and it's like, from this point on, I'm going to support the, the Padres. They are, they are another California team. He and Cindy are embracing tonight's rooftop views. So when we see the game tomorrow, we were, we were sitting here. Exactly. Yeah, we'll pretend to be here in our minds while we're watching we the game. If you didn't score tickets to the game, Altitude Sky Lounge has tickets left for its rooftop, 
Those will cost you $125 a piece. Reporting downtown, Jasmine Ramirez, CBS 8. And there is a free watch party at Petco Park this weekend. And it's not just the Padres celebrating their wins. The San Diego Wave now have their first playoff win in franchise history in their inaugural season. And two Padres players were at the game to cheer them on. Padres pitchers Josh Hader and Steven Wilson were there at Snapdragon rooting them on with the rest of San Diego. And while thousands of baseball fans have taken to downtown to watch the Padres, Many have noticed something a cleaner downtown Imperial Avenue around Petco Park is usually packed with tents, but since the playoffs started, it's been kept tidy. CBS 8's Richard Allen talked to city leaders about sweeps done ahead of the Padres playoff run and explains the new efforts to tackle the homelessness crisis. Well, that's right. This part of East Village along Imperial Avenue is often packed with tents. Now, this sweep of streets and sidewalks surrounding Petco Park in preparation for these championship games comes a couple weeks after the city renewed its policy of ordering homeless people to take down their tents during the daytime. A city spokesperson tells me that they're aiming to balance compassion with the need for public health and safety. They've kind of moved everybody down over towards that area. On his way to the game today, San Diegan Antonio Andrade did a double take after parking in East Village. Yeah, definitely this entire street, this whole section right here is a lot more cleaner than what it used to be. While this is what the area looked like previously, it's a far different story now. East Village resident Sandy Oran says over the last couple weeks, she's noticed tents coming down during the day but going up again at night. But now? Last couple of days, two or three days, I haven't, I haven't seen the tents come back up. And while many tents are still up a block south along commercial, Sandy says she's concerned. I see these people carrying their blankets barefooted, dirty, you know, and they have nowhere to go. I mean, and, you know, they need help. The city of San Diego says it is providing help, saying, quote, the city anticipates a significant increase in pedestrian and vehicular traffic in the East Village area this week. City crews will be offering individuals shelter and services, removing any trash and debris, and ensuring the public right-of-way is clear and free for travel. In the meantime, San Diego City Council is redoubling its efforts to prevent any more San Diegans from losing their homes and ending up on the streets, including declaring housing as a human right at its October 31st meeting. Housing is fundamental to everything else that we want to do and achieve in life. Council President Sean Elo Rivera says there will also be a special workshop to begin hammering out a new tenant protections ordinance after the moratorium on no-fault evictions citywide ended last month. We're in a homelessness crisis. We can't afford to have anybody unnecessarily um, pushed into homelessness. And we know that um, tenant protections are a way of, of preventing homelessness. And keep in mind that that city council workshop set for October 31st, the public is invited to attend and make suggestions on the tenant protection ordinance. For more information, just go to CBS8.com and click on the online version of this story. All right, Richard, thank you. And again, go Padres. Well, SDG&E customers are set to pay hundreds of dollars more next year. That's because the company plans to raise rates in January. SDG&E says this is needed to offset the record high price of natural gas and fund projects to prevent wildfires and modernize the grid. The average monthly electric bill will be about $26 higher. Gas will go up about six bucks a month. That adds up to about $400 a year. There's no good time for a rate increase or, or, or higher bills. Um, but while we're talking to customers so early this year, we want to make sure that they're taking advantage of the programs and services that we have in place to help, be able to help them. Yeah, those services include a discount for low-income customers, payment plans, and $100 million in funds for those behind on their bills. The California Public Utilities Commission still has to approve the rate hike, which could happen in December. Well, now we are digging into new efforts to tackle the opioid crisis in San Diego County. County leaders are ready to spend tens of millions of dollars. CBS 8's Jasmine Ramirez breaks down the new plan as we learned Wednesday of another major fentanyl bust in Southern California. 
Nationwide drug overdose deaths are up year over year. More than 900 San Diegans lost their lives last year. Now local county supervisors are unveiling new details about a push to address the opioid crisis. In my district's most impacted by this. Uh, you've heard that rural communities, tribal communities uh, are at the tip of the iceberg. Supervisor Joel Anderson and Chair Nathan Fletcher are working together. A piece of the plan includes sending wellness advocates to hospitals to meet someone who is overdosed. At the moment someone has survived an overdose, you may have the best opportunity you'll ever get to engage them and talk to them about treatment options. The county will also launch a drug disposal program. You could mail every household in San Diego a drug disposal bag. You open the bag, you pour whatever pharmaceutical prescription drugs you have in it, you add some water and you throw it in the trash. A moment where we could clean the shelves throughout San Diego County. There is also a major focus on local schools. Students will learn about prevention and more Narcan will be distributed to local campuses. We did have a situation with an unresponsive student that um, we're grateful turned out okay. San Diego Unified has had Narcan protocols and drug education in place for years. It plans to act as a model for other districts. It's really important that every parent understand that fentanyl can be in any street drug. Just this Monday, $500,000 worth of fentanyl was seized by San Diego Border Patrol agents near Barstow. All of this will be funded with money from opioid lawsuit settlements. The county believes it will receive up to $100 million, with some of that money arriving by the end of this year. The Board of Supervisors is being asked to approve this plan next Tuesday. Jasmine Ramirez, CBS 8. Jasmine, thanks. Well, migrant advocates are demanding customs and border protection to limit women who are pregnant and nursing. The demand for action from the ACLU follows the controversial in-custody birth of a Guatemalan migrant in 2020. CBS 8's Richard Allen has the details from our newsroom. Well, that's right. Migrant advocates say that their demand is simple. They want Customs and Border Protection to limit their detention of women who are pregnant, postpartum or nursing, saying that each day that passes without this policy places more families at risk. A change to CBP policy that would prevent the detention uh, any longer than necessary of people who are pregnant, postpartum or nursing and their families can save lives. San Diego Monica Langarica is staff attorney at the UCLA Center for Immigration Law and Policy, which along with the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties and Jewish Family Service sent this letter outlining their demands to the head of U.S. Customs and Border Protection. They're doable changes. They don't require an act of Congress. The letter to CBP asked that processing pregnant detainees should not take any longer than 12 hours from the moment the person is initially apprehended, as well as assurances that the CBP release these detainees and their family from custody as soon as possible following discharge from an off-site hospital and not transfer them back to CBP detention. It can ensure Sure that people do are not forced to give birth under extremely dangerous conditions like our client was. Langarica is referring to a 27-year-old pregnant woman from Guatemala who was seeking asylum in February of 2020 when she was arrested by Border Patrol. According to a complaint filed with the U.S. Inspector General Office, instead of being taken to a hospital, the woman was taken to the Chula Vista Border Patrol Station, where she delivered her baby while standing and holding on to a garbage can. After being taken to the hospital following the birth, the woman was then returned to the station, where she was forced to sleep with her newborn on a bench as captured in these images. CBS 8 reached out to Customs and Border Protection for a response to this demand for policy change. A spokesperson instead referred us to CBP's updated guidance on handling pregnant and postpartum detainees, including access to snacks and juice, welfare checks every 15 minutes, and diaper changing stations. We think that is grossly misses the point and is wholly inadequate to uphold the health, the safety, the reproductive rights of this population. And to take a look at the entire letter sent to Customs and Border Protection, as well as CBP's current policy and the Inspector General's review of that February 2020 incident. Just go to cbsa.com, click on the online version of this story. Richard, thanks again. Well, millions of Americans struggling with mild to moderate hearing loss have a new and less expensive option. Hearing aids are now allowed to be sold without a prescription, both online and over the counter at stores. CBS 8's Richard Allen once again has more on what consumers need to know, as well as what doctors are advising patients with hearing problems.
Well, that's right. The price varies, but some chains like CVS and Walmart are offering over-the-counter hearing aids for a couple hundred dollars compared to thousands for prescription aids. I think it's great that people are going to have a chance. San Diegan Maureen Arrigo has been using hearing aids since her mid-30s. She sees the availability of hearing aids without a prescription as a boon for millions of Americans dealing with mild to moderate hearing loss. It's a fair percentage of people who would be willing to try hearing aids. Uh, can't afford them, and that that's just tragic. Over-the-counter hearing aids could cost anywhere between $200 and $3,000, with some drugstore chains offering them for around $800, compared to paying $5,000 or more for a prescription hearing aid. This comes after President Biden issued an executive order earlier this year, calling on the FDA to make hearing aids available without a prescription, to lower their cost, and to expand access. I'm all in favor of going to medical practitioner for things that you need a medical practitioner for, but this just seemed uh, unnecessary for a lot of people. That said, many medical professionals say that over-the-counter hearing aids are appropriate for some patients. People who are starting to notice that they're having a little bit of difficulty. It's not for someone who has a more significant hearing loss, who has trouble in multiple situations, who has hearing loss only in one ear or a sudden loss or ringing only in one ear. Those are all reasons that you absolutely need to see an audiologist. A lot of people are, they go four or five years uh, after they recognize the hearing loss before they do anything about it. Char Siebertson is president of the San Diego chapter of Hearing Loss Association of America, or HLAA. HLAA feels that this will encourage more people to try out hearing aids and not just suffer with the hearing loss. Siebertson also points out that a stigma surrounding hearing loss still exists, despite the fact that it's one of the most common disabilities in the U.S., often afflicting veterans returning from combat. And I think now that it becomes over-the-counter, it's going to be much more acceptable. And customers are advised to check the return policy if they do buy over-the-counter hearing aids. While the FDA does not require that they're returnable, they do require that the return policy be clearly printed on the package. Richard, thank you. So good for so many people. Well, right now, construction is underway for a new fire station in Torrey Pines. Local leaders celebrated this groundbreaking this week. The new station will serve the areas surrounding University City. It comes after a study found the existing fire stations were being strained by the area's growing population. This will also be the first fire station in the entire state with an all-electric firefighting vehicle. Fire Station 52 is expected to open in 2024. Well, when you travel, do you like staying in a hotel or an Airbnb? It's a conversation circulating on social media right now, with some saying they now prefer hotels because those Airbnb cleaning fees really start to add up. CBS 8 Shannon Handy has more on the debate and what she found out. San Diego is a hot spot for Airbnbs, especially here in the beach area, but some people say they're getting pricier, making hotels more desirable. We did it for six nights, so we stayed here for a total of seven days. Kyle Winters and his wife Ashley are in San Diego from Tucson for the week. They opted for a rental in Mission Beach over a hotel, saying while it's a bit more expensive, the convenience pays for itself. It's like a little house, so if you live in a hotel for a week, you're going to be spending way more money three times a day to go out to eat and we have our Yorkie with us and we are 10 steps away from the beach. But not everyone feels the same way. On Twitter this week, Texas runner DFW wrote, the Airbnb bust is upon us as a caption to a screen grab from another group showing an Airbnb host complaining about a decline in bookings. It has since generated thousands of comments. Some blame inflation. One person said they charge an exorbitant amount for the cleaning fee. My family and I are back to booking hotels. Another user posted a breakdown of those fees, saying it made his $185 a night stay in Puget Sound 85% higher. So I did some research and looked up the cost of a three-night rental in Palm Springs for a family of four. I found a breakdown of fees for each one, but they were all across the board, especially the cleaning fees. This one charges $250. Here's one for $359. It turns out owners decide what the cleaning fee should be. Last week, Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky tweeted one of his top priorities is redesigning how pricing on Airbnb works. Today, a spokesperson for the company told me they are testing out new ways to display pricing so they're more upfront, adding, while hosts maintain the ability to choose their own cleaning fees, we do offer tips to hosts on keeping the amount reasonable and suggest they consider not charging cleaning fees at all, saying 45% do not charge a cleaning fee, and for listings that do charge a cleaning fee, 
The fee on average is less than 10% of the total reservation costs. As for how this has impacted business, the spokesperson said compared to 2019, bookings are up 24% in 2022. Bottom line, while some people may have stopped using Airbnb due to the added fees, others say depending on your situation, it's worth it. We're here for the vacation, so we're not really looking at that kind of stuff. Shannon Handy, CBS 8. Interesting conversation, Shannon, thanks. Well, the historic Via Montezuma is set to undergo restoration work thanks to new funding from the state. Mayor Todd Gloria was joined by Senator Ben Hueso, who spearheaded the efforts to secure the necessary money. CBS 8's Rocio de la Fe has more on the and more on the work it will go toward. $5 million in state money will go to keep this enchanting home turned museum in the historic Sherman Heights neighborhood standing tall for many more years to come. Let's get to my favorite part, which is accepting that cash money, everybody, right? City and state leaders announced plans to restore Villa Montezuma. The museum, situated in the historic Sherman Heights district, was awarded a $5 million grant from the state of California to return the villa to its historic condition. It is an important reminder of Sherman Heights cultural, architectural and historic significance. Senator Ben Wazo secured the funds that will go to restoring the home. He was joined by Mayor Todd Gloria, along with president of the Friends of the Villa Montezuma nonprofit, Luis Torrio. It continues to be a challenge to keep this home standing and to keep it uh, beautiful as it once was. Funding will go to repair and restore the exterior, which was last painted 23 years ago. Parts of the roof will be repaired to address leaks and drainage. The landscape will be upgraded and even the priceless stained glass windows that have stood since the home was first built in 1887 will be restored. Historic preservation is incredibly important, especially to inner city neighborhoods. Sometimes this gets forgotten and it is an investment by owners, it's an investment by the city and now an investment by the state that our neighborhood is worthy, that we don't have to be underserved and that we can benefit from cultural heritage tourism to our beautiful, unique, important historic sites. Torrio says the new funding will help preserve the rich history that captivates those who visit. It brings art, music, and literature to your soul, and that is what we want to share. Any planned restoration is expected to start sometime in 2023. In the meantime, historic tours are offered at the museum every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Rocio de la Fe, CBS 8. So beautiful. Rocio, thanks. Well, an El Cajon charter school is getting recognition from state lawmakers for the way it's been teaching kids. For almost 20 years, Ahe Academy's charter school has been a bilingual incubator with grads going to some of the best colleges in the country. Our Jesse Pagan took a walk through the halls of the school to find out why parents say it's so special. <laughs> On this school campus on South Johnson Avenue in El Cajon, you'll likely hear kids playing, laughing, and learning. We have three boys that have been coming to Eje. For mom, Rosa Carp, it's the sound of belonging. The oldest is now going to be turning 15. He started here in kindergarten. The initial instinct to bring our kids here was for them to be bilingual. Rosa says her kids have a clear vision for their futures, courtesy of their schooling at Eje. The teachers never asked the kids if they thought about going to college, it was more like, which college are you going to go to? And she knew it would happen from the very start. I remember sitting in that crowd and the moment I heard the teachers talking about the things our kids were going to be exposed to, the culture that they were going to be surrounded with, I had a sense of pride and just a feeling of blessing. More than 800 kids go to school at Eje Academies from TK through 8th grade. 90% of them are Latino and almost as many come from low-income households. A majority of them will be the first in their families to graduate college. <laughs> the curriculum at Eje is typical, except for a couple of things. I hear you can speak in English, or you can speak in Spanish, or you can speak in your third language. Classes happen in either or both languages, with the idea being kids will strengthen their native one while learning the other, all at high academic levels. Era una escuela que iban a demoler. Eva Pacheco is the school's executive director and one of its founders, a position she found herself in after her daughter's first time in school. She was very outspoken, very social, and being in a classroom with a monolingual teacher, of course, 
she couldn't understand anything the teacher was teaching. Pacheco and her husband talked with other parents and figured out how to work the school system. Soon after, a program for bilingual kids with bilingual teachers was born. Eje officially opened as a charter school years later. Last month, State Senator Brian Jones presented Pacheco with a resolution recognizing her service to the community. I think that's the beauty of this unique space. You embrace the culture, you embrace the language, and you embrace people. Fifth grader Mylena Hernandez is well on her way to her goal of becoming a doctor or a speech writer. Communication is really important because sometimes you don't know what's like going on in their life and yeah, you don't know like what they're doing. College prep is also important here. AVID, a prep class, is one of the most popular electives, often full with its own waiting list. And most, if not all the kids, have big personalities to boot. I don't know, tell me. <laughs> kids here don't feel like they're unseen. They really feel like they're important to the staff. A result, Rosa says, of the way teachers and Pacheco approach their work. Pues esta, esta es mi misión. Jesse Pagan there reporting. And the school says they have a waiting list for students to get in at the moment. They are also in the process of renovating their current campus and building an extension for the higher grades and to support alumni in high school and college who come back for guidance. Well, the red carpet rolled out for the San Diego International Film Festival. Some familiar faces were out to promote some of their films. And CBS 8's uh, Regina Urita has more from the Conrad Prebis Performing Arts Center there in La Jolla. In its 21st year, the San Diego International Film Festival returns with the Night of the Stars tribute. Tony Amantu, the CEO of the festival, called the night a huge success and added that this year's film focuses on topics like social justice, women, and LGBTQ rights. It's really our way of honoring the celebrities, the actors that come down here and, and really we appreciate their work and, and that's what tonight is about, is to really celebrate them. Andy Garcia, who starred in The Untouchables and The Godfather Part 3, was awarded the Gregory Peck Award, the highest achievement award at the festival. I asked him about his long career in Hollywood that's earned him this honor. That's the Godfather one. It was the movie that that uh, inspired me to try to become an actor and do that kind of work. He also talked about the state of Latino representation in the film industry. The opportunities have, 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 have grown and the diversity have grown not only for Hispanics but for other, other cultures. But we still haven't gotten really our share of the story. There was also Regina Hall, whose recent work includes Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. Hall received an award for her past and current comedy films. She expresses how proud she is of her growth. It's incredible to see the journey of a career mirror your own growth. You know what I mean? To have an opportunity to have, you know, what you feel inside to be able to express that artistically in different ways. The festival lineup includes 115 films. One of those films being introduced is called Lovely Jackson, a biographical film about a black Cleveland man by the name of Ricky Jackson who was wrongfully convicted for murder and was exonerated 40 years after. Tonight I talked to Ricky's brother and asked him how he felt reliving the events on the big screen. It took me back. It took me back to that moment. I could see the lights in my eyes when the police came bursting through the door. Here I am, a 15, 16 year old in my underwear, terrified out of my mind. Regina Urita there reporting, and right now there are screenings there at Conrad Prebis and then in Balboa Park as well, starting at $16. Closing night will take place on Sunday. Well, as of October 1st, the rain calendar was reset and we are officially in the rainy season now through April. April for the third straight year. We're looking at La Nina conditions with cooler sea surface temperatures. That is very unusual. Meteorologist Sean Stiles looks at what that could mean for precipitation out west for this winter. San Diego is potentially heading into its third year of drought. The state of California, it's fourth, and we're looking at another La Nina, which generally means less rain. Let's take a look at what could happen here as far as rainfall is concerned. 2020 
2021, 21, 22, two back-to-back -back years, water years, that were about 60% of average. Alex Tardy is a meteorologist with NOAA at the National Weather Service. And multiple years of all this warm water bottled up in the He told me Pacific that 2018, 2019 was even drier. Very dry. I think it was like top five in terms of dry. Yeah, we've been on a roller coaster. We're just now starting our rainy season that lasts through April. And for the third year in a row, La Nina is in the eastern Pacific. This is the cooler sea surface temperatures that can change our weather patterns. It's still the same magnitude, same intensity. And the reason why that has some importance is it influences not just the ocean temperatures, but it influences our weather, especially our rainy season. Why that matters is La Nina can shift the storms and leave much of California out of the storm track. And since most of our water comes from rain and snow in the Sierra Nevada and the Rocky Mountains, that can be a huge problem to our water supply. The stress on the water supply where we're getting it all from, Colorado and Northern California, is much greater than just two years. The hard part about La Nina is forecasting the weather. 2010-2011, similar La Nina as we're dealing with right now, in the ocean at least. One of the wettest years in the Sierra Nevada on record. Uh, one of the snowiest years on record, 2010, 2011. However, the current models say different. The model guidance, 60, 90 days out, they all are indicating much higher odds of drier than normal for most of California. For the Colorado Basin, where 60% of our water comes from, the outlook is much better with an equal chance for average precipitation. For Tardy, he prefers to look at the glass half full when it comes to California and San Diego. There's still a solid 30% chance that we could see at least normal. We'll take normal. So even though La Nina is in place, there's still a 30% chance that we could see average rainfall for the Western United States. We'll have to wait and see what heads our way. I'll send it back to you in the studio. Yeah, we certainly need that rain, Sean, thanks. As always, thank you for your time. Thank you for staying informed. Hope you join me each week as I take you around San Diego. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. Take good care and go Padres.